Good afternoon. So my story for you today is about two of my lifelong passions that started out separately and eventually came together. So ever since I was a little kid, six years old or so, I've been fascinated by the game of soccer. I've played, I've watched, and I've just, it's been amazing to me that teams of people can come together and do such complex action sequences as you see on the screen there. Now, at the same time, I was fascinated by computers and the ability that we had to program them to do things that they hadn't done before. And that second passion led me to go to university and study computer science and eventually become interested in artificial intelligence, the possibility that computers could help us make progress on one of the great scientific frontiers of our time, namely understanding the nature of intelligence and how the human brain works. So I then went on to, to graduate, graduate school to study artificial intelligence. And in the first year, I worked on an area called AI planning. I published a paper. I went to the main AI conference that summer in Seattle, and I saw a demonstration that really changed my life. A professor from University of British Columbia, Alan Mackworth, and his students had created a system with two remote-controlled robots that they had now changed so that the computer could control them, one on each side on a ping-pong table, so small little cars, knocking a ping-pong ball to try to score a goal. They were robots playing soccer. And to me, this represented a great opportunity to bring together my passion from a um, professional perspective and my hobby playing soccer. But there was something missing. Having one robot on each side was missing what we saw on the, on the screen, this, this teamwork, this working together aspect. And so I spent the next couple of days carefully crafting an argument for my PhD advisor to convince her that I should really be working on robot soccer. This would be a great domain to help us understand artificial intelligence. It would help us work on planning and sensing. I had it all planned out. I had all the words I was going to say, all the right order. The next time I saw her, she was coming down a long escalator. I was going up. My friend standing next to me yelled out, Manuela, Peter wants to work on robot soccer. And she shrugged her shoulders and said, OK. <laughs> so that was a lucky break for me. I had a very open-minded and supportive PhD advisor. And so we did it. We started working on trying to make robots that can play soccer, not just for the sake of, of that, but for the sake of trying to advance science. And I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go. Now, there was another lucky break, which was at that same time, there was a group of people in Japan who had a similar idea. They were trying to build up robot soccer as an international challenge problem to advance AI and robotics and start a worldwide competition. And so in 1997, there was a, uh, the first international RoboCup, Robot Soccer World Cup. And um, the idea here was that there, just like other challenge problems in, that had existed before robot soccer, the idea was to try to use this just as a domain with the idea that good problems produce good science. So for instance, the Wright brothers set for themselves the challenge of manned flight. They had to discover the Bernoulli principle. It was known in water, but not in air at the time. The Apollo mission, and in some sense you can say, well, who cares if a man walks on the moon? But on the other hand, to achieve that, the engineers had to make great advances in telemetry, remote body, um, body monitoring. And then the Manhattan Project, splitting the atom, arguably had positive and negative consequences. But undeniably, great progress in science from the perspective of high energy physics and scientific computing. So these are all challenges that achieved their, their end goals. The one that I'm talking about today, robot soccer, we're still in progress. But we do have a goal in mind as well, a very concrete one. And that's by the year 2050 to create a team of robots that can beat the World Cup champions on a real soccer field. So this is uh, originally Hiroaki Kitano came up with this, with this goal. And now people around the world are, are working towards this. Some people ask, well, why 2050? Well, this is a very ambitious goal. But 50 years is also a long time. From the time that the Wright brothers did have the first manned flight to landing a man on the moon was a little longer than 50 years. From the first computer to beating the world chess champion by a computer, uh, Deep Blue beating Kasparov, that was about 50 years. And also, we've learned in AI that predictions 
are so uh, apt to be wrong that it's best to pick a year after you've retired if you're going to make a prediction. <laughs> In any case, RoboCup 97 happened, and the, uh, this, is, this is what it looked like. And it, watching this video, is a little embarrassing in, 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 for me right now. I mean, these robots sort of look horrible. They're falling over, they're, uh, they're moving in circles, they're running into walls even sometimes. <laughs> but you have to understand that back in 1997, that most roboticists didn't even have a robot. They worked on just the vision problem or just the decision-making problem. Just getting robots all working together, five of them uh, on a team, was a big success. And so, you know, and there were some goals scored. Um, you know, sort of slowly, and often with no opposition from the, uh, from the goalies, but it, but it happened. <laughs> so you see up in the right corner now, yeah, there, there's no goalie there, but you know, we still celebrated. So, um, we, my, my team actually was, was in one of these leagues, there's different leagues in RoboCup, but they, the uh, thing that's the same is that they're never controlled by a person, it's all fully autonomous, the, ro the computer is controlling them. So, Moving forwards, I then came to Austin in 2002 as a professor here, and I decided to found a, a new RoboCup team called, uh, and you'll, if you know English soccer, you'll get the reference. We call ourselves UT Austin Villa. Not many people in America laugh at that one. But um, we, went to the first, we went to our first RoboCup. It was in the standard platform league where everybody has the same robots. And uh, so it's just a, a programming competition. And the first one in 2003, we did horribly. We lost all of our games, although we did have one highlight, which I'll show you right here. Our goalie, uh, there was a long shot from the opposing team here, and our goalie very nonchalantly uh, waited to the last second and uh, knocked the ball out of the way. So, <laughs> so we were happy about that. And then looking forwards a couple years, in, by 2005, you can hopefully notice the progress from, from 1997. Now, many of the same leagues here you're seeing, and by the way, these are not all my robots. These are robots from people from around the world. This is a very large community now. Every RoboCup has maybe 2,000 researchers or so from around the world working. But these robots are faster individually. You're starting to see teamwork. In the bottom right corner was the beginning of the humanoid league, so they're just doing penalty kicks. <laughs> That's actually, that league has uh, advanced a lot now as well. But there was, you know, it's, it's very striking to me going back every year <laughs> to see the progress that's happening. Now, I promised you I'd tell you a little bit about why we do this, right? Just like those other challenge problems, the, who cares if we have robots that can beat people at, at soccer? But to get there, we're going to have to solve some problems. So right now, you're seeing what the world looks like through the robot's camera when it's playing soccer. And now, there's no, no magic here. This is input to a computer program. So we have to write a program that takes these images that you see on the left side of the screen, and turns them into uh, the, some of the images on the right side of the screen. So the one on the right now is showing that it's detected the goal. But on the left side, 30 times a second, the robot is, is getting just a bunch of, of, well, it's getting pictures, which you can detect, you can see with your eyes. But to the robot, it's just a bunch of numbers. And so we have to write the program that tells it where's the orange ball, where's the yellow goal. So that's one of the things that we've, we've done research on. And, and to be able to do that is important beyond robot soccer computers being able to sense the world. Another thing is getting the robots to learn. And, and um, before we, we started working on this, the robot, people would program the robots very laboriously to, uh, to walk by saying exactly where all the joints should go um, over time, the sequence of commands. What you're seeing now, the video, is um, the idea of two of my PhD students, Nate Cole and Peggy Fiddleman, that let's make the robots learn for themselves. So here they're practicing walking back and forth across the field, experimenting with moving their legs faster or having them farther apart. And we could go out to lunch and come back a few hours later and the robots had learned to walk faster or control the ball on the right side of the, the screen. And not only did that save us time, at the end of the day, we had a walk on these robots that was about 10 to 20% faster than anybody had created on these robots. So that got us a lot of notoriety and, and by the next year, everybody was learning the walks on the robots. But again, this is a general thing that can be used um, for robots not just playing soccer. So uh, what I'm showing you now is, is uh, Fox Soccer Channel took some of our, our uh, highlights and um, took a little artistic liberty. We don't have fan support like that when, when we go to the competitions. <laughs> but you can see what it looks like once they're doing all of these things. These robots on board are doing that vision. They're seeing where the ball is. They're deciding where to go, where to kick. <laughs> And um, I'm not going to be able to show you this whole video, but it's up there on, on, the, uh, on the website. 
Um, so, I, and I'll, I'll let you uh, let you see this one last one because one of the other research challenges here is also knowing where the robot is over time. So here you see it bumps into the goalie, but it still knows where it is enough to kick the ball sideways. So moving forwards, that was when the robots were used were these four-legged robots. Now this is the finals of the 2012 competition where we now use humanoid robots. These are now robots made by a French company called Elderbaron. And again, it's the standard platform league, so both teams had the same robots. There were 30 teams from around the world that, that started in this competition, and this is the finals. My, my team is the one, UT Austin Villa is the one with the hands behind their backs. Um, we do that so that they won't run into the other robots as well as much. There's penalties for running into the other robots, so sometimes you see a person coming and picking up the robot and taking it off the field. But I'm going to run this just for a little while until you can see the first goal. Um, <laughs> The team we were playing was from, from Germany. They'd won the competition from University of Bremen the last three years in a row. Their, their goalie makes a very nice save. Um, but you have to remember here that there's nobody remote controlling these robots. They're doing it themselves. And um, here, the, the other team's robots actually did run into us a few times. They got pulled off the field for penalties, so our, we, our robot capitalized that with that um, to take a breakaway. And here, I'll just let you see the first goal. So the, we ended up winning that game 4-2, to two, and we're now the reigning World Cup champions in robot soccer. The university was very, very proud of us, and they only do this you know, usually when the football team wins, but they lit up the tower orange for us, so we were very, very proud of that. Now, I promise you also that you know, robot soccer isn't just about trying to get robots that can beat people, there's also applications. And, um, just to give you a brief view, people have used robots to, from RoboCup, some of the same ideas to do search and rescue, looking for victims after earthquakes or other natural disasters. Here you see two um, possible applications. One, the one on the left is in real life, a company called Kiva Systems, uses robots to bring the shelves in the Amazon.com warehouses to, their, uh, to the people who are doing the packing. One of the founders of that com company, Raft Andrea, got his start in RoboCup with robots um, and won the competition in 1999. On the right, you see one of, uh, one of my students envisioned what would the world look like when we have all autonomous cars, when they can communicate with the intersection and we don't need traffic signals or stop signs anymore, but they can just go right through the intersection and save a lot of time, fuel, and efficiency. Many of the same ideas that go into the teamwork of robot soccer go into that as well. So, we're going on now. My two passions persist. I still play soccer. I'm on a team in town, Waterloo FC. We're the over 30 champions of Austin for the past five years. And I continue to work on artificial intelligence and computer science, my other passion. But I'm happiest when those two come together. And here you see an opportunity I had in 2011 to play against the champions of one of the other RoboCup leagues, the middle-sized league. And uh, here you'll see that the people are, are still able to do better than the robots. Of course, I picked this clip because I score a goal at the end of it. Um, but, uh, you know, so the robots aren't there yet. It's still the case that a, a bunch of middle-aged professors can beat the robots. <laughs> but we're still working towards the goal. I probably will be, I will be too old to be on the field myself in 2050 when the robots play, play people. But I hope to be in the audience. I hope you will be too. And I know I, for one, will be cheering for the robots. Thank you.